Adam Lerner, and I'm here today to talk to you guys a little bit about maintenance, tech talk, tech time. Um, what I'd like to talk to you guys about is specifically, uh, some of you guys might be shooting tethered. Um, I know that when I'm on set, uh, particularly when I'm shooting fashion, I'm shooting tethered. And for those of you that don't know what tethered means, um, tethered means that you're, instead of capturing the images to the memory card that's built into your camera that you've inserted into your camera, you're actually um, connecting your camera to your computer or a computer and the images are being written to the computer. Now, why would you want to shoot tethered? Well, uh, one of the primary reasons to shoot tethered is because you've got a huge display to be able to check the images on. And particularly when you're shooting with a client, it really is helpful because the client, whether they're an art director or whatever their, their role may be, you can look at the images, you can look at the lighting, you can see how the, uh, the lighting is, is, is hitting the subject. Um, there's a lot of things that you, can, that you can learn from looking at actual images on a screen, uh, computer screen, as opposed to looking just on the back of the camera. And look, you know, I think a lot of us have been there where we've looked on the back of the camera and we're like, wow, that looks awesome. And then you actually get the, the image loaded into your computer and you realize, yeah, you know, the focus was a little bit off or as good as I thought that the lighting was, it could have been better. So this really eliminates a lot of that kind of guessing work because when you're sitting there and you're booked on a job and you've got all these different people that are booked with you as well, you want to be able to deliver the best possible results because it's not like there's second chances here. Now, I, I've been shooting tethered for, for you know a few years now. And one thing that I'd noticed is that I, I have a MacBook Pro that I used specifically for shooting tethered. And uh, a while ago, I had taken out the, uh, the hard drive that came with the computer and I installed myself, I installed a 500 gigabyte, 7200 RPM drive. Now the drive that comes with it, I think was maybe a 320, 5400 RPM drive. And you're thinking, well, the difference is kind of incremental. It's small, but actually the difference was pretty big. It made a big difference. Um, both in the fact that it's a much faster drive, it spins a lot faster, and it's a higher capacity. And hard drives, when they start to get full, they really slow down. Their performance is, is greatly compromised. And when you're writing and you're buffering files like that, you need virtual space. You need empty space in your hard drive for the, the computer to use that space in order to write files. Okay, now, the other thing that I did with my laptop is I had four gigs of RAM in there, and um, I'm able to upgrade to eight gigs of RAM, so I maxed out the RAM. So, you know, I felt a pretty nice little, you know, bump in performance when shooting tethered. Then we were starting to shoot a lot of frames, and that means that, you know, we're just doing a lot of sequential stuff, and there's, you know, there's not a lot of time for buffering, okay? And what was happening is I was noticing that on occasion, the laptop would just basically lock up. Lightroom would just say, you know what? that's too much, I can't handle it, and Lightroom would just kind of quit, or it would, it would not be able to buffer the files quickly enough onto the drive. So I did a bunch of research, talked to some photographer friends, and uh, you know, specifically, uh, Zach Arias had an incredible tip, and I followed it to a T. And what I ended up doing is I ended up taking the optical drive, the DVD drive, out of my laptop, and I replaced that with an SSD drive. Now, these SSD drives are incredible. The write times are astonishingly fast. Um, there's no moving parts in there, so it, mechanically, the drive is not as, you know, subject, subje the drive is not going to be subjected to drive failure as would a normal uh, disk drive or, you know, that has a, plate that spins around at a certain speed, 7,200 RPMs or whatever. Um, now, what I ended up doing is I, I completely wiped the machine and I used the SSD drive as my primary drive, meaning that I installed a fresh version of Mac OS X Lion and all of my applications on it only. So that's it. So the SSD drive, I'm, I simply am using as my system and applications drive. And then I moved all of my files and told all my applications like, like Lightroom to only write files to the 500 gig drive. Well, 
I can't even begin to tell you what the difference was like. That very first time I booted up, it was instantaneous. The very first time I launched Lightroom, it just popped and flew open. Even Photoshop, same thing, boom. And you know, honestly, previously, I would use Photoshop to some extent on that laptop, but it wasn't terrific. And now it actually is really viable. It actually works quite well. And this is not a new MacBook Pro. So what I'm saying is by removing the optical drive, replacing that with an SSD drive as my startup drive um, or my system and apps drive, I was able to give my machine an incredible, incredible performance bump. And I can tell you that, you know, having spent the last week or so um, shooting fashion stuff, you know, where we're just doing thousands of frames all day long, um, writing just tons of files, we did not have any problems, which was amazing. Um, even cycling through, even the refresh rate, you know, when you cycle through the Lightroom library and you're looking through and you're just holding the arrow keys, the images would just fly by. There was no issues with redraw. So I just wanted to let you guys know that, that there are often inexpensive ways for you guys to do this. I mean, I think that the drive and the adapter was maybe, I went for the 120 uh, gig SSD drive. I think it was like $250 or so, which I think is really, really good money spent. Um, rather than buying a new laptop, because honestly, I don't even know that a new laptop with an optical, I'm sorry, with a standard uh, SATA drive would have actually made the difference. So um, that's what I really wanted to talk to you guys about is that, you know, often you can take existing equipment that you have and you can get a lot more out of it. You know, oftentimes, you know, people are frustrated. You don't know what to do. There's a huge community out there. There's a lot of people on on you know that you can google there's a lot of professional working photographers like zach and others out there that are willing to share this information and i wanted to share this guys this with you guys as well because it made a huge difference i bought my ssd drive and and adapter optical drive kit adapter from max sales or owc otherworld computing dot it's actually maxsales.com but they go by otherworld computing i've used those guys for years um, I'm not being paid to endorse them, but I can tell you that um, they offer amazing service and amazing products at really, really very reasonable prices and great shipping. So that's my rant, or uh, I wouldn't even say rant. I guess that's my tip on how to get more life out of a MacBook Pro. And honestly, the, the difficulty level is not that terrible. I mean, they send you a little kit with all the tools that you need. Um, they have instructional video on their website, so if you follow that and you're 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 savvy enough that you're not afraid to do this kind of thing, it's 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 quite doable. Okay, if you're not comfortable opening up your computer and pulling stuff out, definitely don't do it because it's not for anybody and everybody. But I definitely recommend this fix. Um, so just you know, keeping the discussion going, I wanted to just kind of talk about my continued thoughts on the Fuji X100. Um, this camera has become literally one of my favorite cameras. Um, I've been shooting this thing nonstop. It, it, I honestly, I never leave the house without it. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of those cameras that it fits in my jacket pocket. Um, I often put on a, a, a black rapid strap and just put the little thing down there and like kind of hang it off of my shoulder. Um, I've actually used this in the studio with the, uh, the, the flash here has a commander mode where you can basically use it to optically fire strobes. Um, I haven't yet gotten into uh, pocket wizards and speed lights, but I'm certainly going to do that. I really don't think that this camera is going to replace any of my professional equipment, but what I can say is that this camera goes with me everywhere I go. A lot of you guys have been asking me questions about it. Well, you know, you're wondering about the shutter thing. You're wondering about, you know, the read and write times. You guys are wondering about um, firmware. There's a lot of concerns out there. And I think that, you know, if you really just spend your time reading reviews and looking at data sheets, um, you're going to get hung up on those types of questions. And to be honest, like I basically you know, talk to other photographers, actual photographers, and ask them what they thought of it. And that's kind of what it comes down to is that it's very easy for people to get hung up on looking at spec sheets and data sheets and going to forums and reading every little nuance and people saying, well, there's going to be more noise here and the ISO sensitivity is this and this and this and this and this. 
honestly, all of that stuff leads to analysis paralysis, meaning that you just end up sitting there and analyzing all of this data, but you actually aren't really paying attention to what real photographers or people that are using this camera are saying about it. Now, granted, there are going to be people that are going to have really negative things to say about this, but that's going to be true about any kind of piece of gear out there. But what I can tell you guys is that this is a one trick pony. This camera does one thing and it does one thing really, really well. Um, it's certainly not going to be a DSLR. And uh, as far as using it in a professional capacity, I would say I would keep it in my tool bag, meaning that I'm going to bring my Nikon D3S out with me to do a professional job. However, I'm going to keep the, the X100 in the bag. There's always going to be use for it. The other thing that I find that's really cool about it is that just in walking around doing street shots, I find that I can get even closer to people than I did in the past. You kind of have to with the 35. Um, and people are not really turned off or intimidated by it. I also uh, have found that, you know, just even taking random portraits of friends or strangers even, people are much more inclined to just say, sure, why not, when you hold this thing up rather than when you hold up a big DSLR. And that applies to anything, you know, whether it's a Canon, you know, TI or a D300 or a D3100, I mean, up to a D3S, whatever. There's something about a DSLR that just, I think, can be intimidating when you're in a non-professional situation and you just kind of hold it up to take somebody's picture where there's something about this kind of retro look that people are more inclined to, uh, you know, to be okay with. Now, as far as ISO, um, I try to, well, actually, you know what? I, let me just start that again. As far as ISO, I've shot all the way up to ISO 6400. Now, at ISO 6400, it is noisy as heck. Um, I find that, that, that images up to about ISO 1600 are really, really quite good. Once you go beyond 1600, and this is for me, again, unscientific, um, once you go beyond 1600, you know, you definitely see some noise creeping in. Um, and then obviously, you know, once you get 2000, 4000, 6400, you know, you're getting a much noisier image. However, the color detail, I mean, or the color is still really, really nice. There's still a lot of detail in there. Um, so it is quite, uh, it's quite capable. Let's just say that. Um, it's quirky. Uh, the, the startup time is a little bit slow. Uh, sometimes trying to navigate through the controls on here can be a little bit frustrating. Um, there's certain things like, okay, I'll say, here, here's some things that I would have, I would like to see on this. You know, to change the ISO, you've got to hit this little teeny beeny, teeny weeny little function button. And then you've got to use this little jog dial here to do that. Now, when you've got this up to your face, you know, and you've got these other dials here, I find that to be an awkward maneuver. I would love it if there was just an ISO button over here and I could just, an ISO button over here and I could just turn that and just change the ISO. I would love to have a dedicated ISO button. Um, another thing I find is that there's no way for you to rename your files. Uh, I know that, you know, in, in, you know, the Nikon, of course, um, I, you know, give them my own file name. I put in some metadata information. As far as I know, and I could be wrong, I mean, I have read the manual. I don't see that the way to do that um, in, in, you know, on the camera. And I find that to be, you know, a little bit uh, frustrating because I think that that's important. Um, the other thing that I also find is that, you know, as good as this exposure compensation dial is, I find that this thing gets turned all the time. Um, I don't know if maybe it should have, should be a little bit harder to turn or maybe it should be a little bit recessed, um, like the, uh, shutter speed dial. Maybe if that was just a little bit recessed into the top of the body, that would probably prevent that from happening. Um, but you know what, all of that aside, you know, I still think that this is remarkable. The viewfinder on here is so bright. Um, you know, I've tried using AF, uh, C, you know, continuous focus on here. It's not bad. You know, you can lock in and you can, you know, follow your subject. Um, I pretty much shoot on AFS, uh, single servo. And the thing that I like is that, you know, it's got a focus beep. Um, I would also like to see, I would have liked to have seen if this was able to focus at a closer distance. I think, I don't know what the technical spec is, but I'm guessing that the uh, distance is probably maybe uh, three and a half feet which is good. Um, I would like to see something a little bit closer. I, I would like to be able to focus, you know, maybe at, uh, 
you know, two feet or something like that. Um, but, you know, look, you can't have everything with this camera. And that's the thing for all the people out there that are wondering, you know, will this replace anything? You know, what about all the different nuances? I think that it's one of those things that you have to kind of accept and that you hope that with version two, there'll be some modifications um, to the camera. You know, honestly, I don't really feel that there's anything lacking and I'm perfectly happy with the way it is. But just having grown accustomed to other, you know, shooting, um, there's certain things that I would like. Now, when I got this camera, I've only shot, actually, since I've got this camera, I've only shot fully manually. And I think that this camera is a terrific camera to learn how to shoot fully manually with because all the, you know, the dials are so, and the buttons are so nicely laid out and just everything just works so positively on here. Um, I know that the X-Pro1 is uh, about to pop. That's the uh, the Fuji's uh, modular, um, well, modular, I don't know if I would call it that. Yeah, I guess it's a modular system where it's, it's a body, a pro body um, and uh, pro lenses. And it's kind of a smaller sized um, body. I guess it's somewhere in the Leica M9 size and look and feel. Um, I don't want to do any speculating, but from what I've read, as far as what they've done with the sensor and, uh, you know, the improvements that they've made, um, it looks to be an amazing camera, and I honestly can't wait to get my hands on one. That camera, in some way, seems like it could potentially be something in my pro arsenal, in my pro bag. Um, but you know what? It, it, again, it, I have yet to see the kind of results that we can get with that. Um, as far as the Nikon D800, D800e, um, I feel that, you know, from really, really giving this a lot of thought, I would not go with the E. Uh, as much as, you know, it might be cool to have that extra detail, um, I think that the amount of work that might be, that you might have to take on in order to account for the moiré issues that you might have, um, I don't know that that extra level of sharpness or detail is going to be noticeable enough to make the uh, the post uh, worthwhile. So as far as I'm concerned, if I were to go with the D800, I would just get the standard D800, not the D800E. That's just my opinion. I'm sure you know people are going to have reasons to go with either. Uh, as far as the D4, um, again, you know, I'm on the fence. My D3S is an amazing, amazing camera. The D4 is going to be a more amazing camera. Um, but, you know, the jury is still out on, on where I'd go with that. Uh, as far as D700 goes, um, I still think it's a really viable camera. You know, I think it's like one of those cameras that the fact that it doesn't shoot video and it just is a still camera is kind of a novelty. Um, interestingly... In some way, I would like to see some of these big camera manufacturers like Nikon, like Canon, have certain cameras that are just still photography cameras and certain cameras that maybe do both. Um, I, I, I would like to see maybe more attention go going toward just the still photography part on some of the cameras. But you know what? You can't really have everything. And I guess for them to stay competitive in the market, you know, they're, they're doing a bit of both. Um, and, and, you know, Nikon, Canon, they're pretty much doing the same type of thing, which is, you know, really cool. I mean, the new, the new systems that are coming out there are, are pretty amazing. So that's, uh, I guess that's it for now. I just wanted to kind of have like a, a random tech talk day with you guys. Um, I definitely would like to see your comments below and see what you guys are thinking about as well. Um, if you have any questions or comments, definitely do leave them below. That's it for now. And we'll see you soon.